It's time for another edition of Around the Nest, where we go all around the Blue Jays minor league system, talking prospects, talking happenings, and having some fun along the way. Tyler Zickel from Vancouver, and a full nest today as my fellow nesters join us on this Friday, wrapping up the 2021 season. Hard to believe we are entering the last weekend of the return to minor league baseball. Pat, Andrew, Tyler, good day, gentlemen, and of course, our producer, Leo, behind the scenes, making it all happen today. Boys, it's been an exciting week. And with that, how about this? We'll start at the bottom of the ladder today, simply because history has been made twice for the Dunedin Trent Palmer Blue Jays. Andrew Trifley, good day. Great to be here. There's only three days left. Uh, tough end of the season, but it's got to end at some point, I guess, right? Yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think all of us can agree that there's a little bit of joy and a little bit of sorrow for the season coming to an end and certainly taking in every last pitch as we get it. Let's talk about one and only Trent Palmer. I mean, he throws a seven inning no hitter with his mom in the building just a few weeks ago. And then he does it again just the other day. Truly something that you never see at any level and in this amount of time. What was it like to just be around for history twice? I mean, it's honestly unbelievable. Like just to watch it, you kind of, you kind of, you you could feel it to be honest. Like after this, he came in after the second inning, and I was sitting in the dugout uh, taking photos, and he comes in and he's like, "My stuff is just terrible today," and I was like, "Okay, uh, if, if you say so." And he came up for the third inning, and he struck out the first two guys, and then he, the third guy, just like lazy pop up to the second baseman and he was like visibly frustrated that he didn't strike the third guy out and and he just you, I knew at that point like he, he could definitely do this again because you could tell just how locked in he was uh and I mean he's just excited to watch even as his start before this one he struck out 11 guys so it's incredible a lot of times in historic moments like that, there's some great defense once or twice throughout the night to potentially rob a hit. Did we have any of that, or was it all just Trent Palmer dicing up the opponent? No, it was actually a lot of contact. I mean, to be fair to Trent, he he was getting hit around in the first uh, first and second inning. Um, Stuart Barroa made some great plays out in left field, who's now in double A uh, with Tyler Murray. A lot of uh, shuffling around these last week. Um, and Desan Brown always makes a great play. He's incredible defender um so yeah i mean he did get hit around but he had the defensive behind him uh so two very different no hitters and certainly something to look forward to as he climbs the ladder and continuing to hopefully make that kind of impression at every stop along the way obviously just three more days left so not a whole lot to necessarily look forward to but over this last week plus and especially since we missed out on an episode a week ago any of the newcomers on that DJ's roster coming out of the complex league or coming over from the Dominican making any sort of impact that's been noticeable you know I mean guys that have been here for a little bit uh Michael Dominguez last night went six innings of his own with just one hit and uh, eight strikeouts uh so that's been exciting to see um Adriel Soto Longo had the uh, a double uh, in the Trent Palmer no hitter to uh, give us a 3-0 lead. Uh, so that was great to see some timely hitting. Um, I think what you miss is uh, PK Morris. I think you take PK Morris for granted a little bit. I think some may even say that he could be one of the best defenders in our system. Uh, and just the balls that he picks uh, at first base and the plays that he can make, uh, you take it for granted. I certainly have enjoyed seeing the first few games in P.K. Morris's high A career and certainly a guy that can make a big impact sooner rather than later. So certainly we'll get to him when we talk about the Canadians. But A.T., as we wrap up this edition, checking in with you down there in low A, we're going to do another episode to wrap up the season, whether that's next week or at the very end of when the final stretch in AAA comes to an end so we can get Pat's view on his full season with the Bisons and, of course, talk all things 2021. But as you look ahead to the offseason, what are some of the things that are in the cards either around the office for you or maybe in your personal life? We talk all baseball all the time. We sprinkle in the personal life, especially when Tyler Murray and I, we get going three years in the same office. It's going to happen for you. But what's ahead for Andrew Triffley once the season comes to a close? You looking forward to doing anything you haven't done in weeks, months, or even a year plus? You know, I just haven't seen enough baseball. So the, the Blue Jays are in town playing the Rays next week. So I'll probably go watch them play. Um, got a wedding, a friend's wedding over in New York uh, a couple of days after that. So I'll be up 
uh, in the New York area for a week. And then I, uh, I'm going to go home the week after that, uh, see the family, go to an LSU football game. Uh, nothing better. Uh, it will be good to see the family after a few months away. AT, thanks as always. Well-deserved break coming up. And I'll tell you this, I think you've had as many poor episodes as Trent Palmer had hits the other night. So seriously, every single week, showing up strong, representing for Loe Deneen. Andrew, thanks as always. Appreciate you. All right, we'll go all the way to the top of the ladder now. Pat Malacaro, good day. The newly minted Northeast Division champions, the Buffalo Bisons. Congratulations. We've talked all season long. What a special team this is. But Man, how are the vibes at Salem Field? I mean, this, this team could not be riding any higher right now. Uh, having won 14 of the last 17 games and a team which going into the series against Scranton Wilkesbury was two games back of the Rail Riders. And you're thinking, okay, it's a seven game series. Maybe you win four out of, out of the seven, make up a game and we'll see where we go from there over the final uh, two weeks of the season. Well, you win all seven. I mean, that's unheard of, not only in, in this uh, in this season where you have in AAA six game series against the same team for a week at a time, but to take all seven, two double headers in the process uh, is unheard of. It's a franchise record. Uh, and it's something that I, I don't know that uh, when we look back on it, we, we can overstate how important that was uh, in this pennant chase. And really, uh, you know, unfortunately for the team, the only downside was the loss to Rochester yesterday the team had a chance to clinch the division with a victory and celebrate, uh, you know, on the field uh, responsibly in, in, in their own terms. Instead, it came last night way after the Bisons 105 game when they lost to Rochester with Scranton Wilkesbury losing to Lehigh Valley. So glad that the Bisons clinched last night, but I wish the team would have been able to celebrate kind of on their own terms instead of, uh, you know, having uh, Scranton Wilkesbury lose last night and, and with four and a half games back of the Bisons and, and, now three to play for Buffalo and four for Scranton left. Um, it's officially clinched. Certainly some tempered excitement, but at the same time, a lot to look forward to and a lot to be proud of. And I'm certainly glad that you brought up that impressive stretch against the Rail Riders because it's almost as if AAA and the big leagues has been mirroring each other a little bit this season. And it sometimes seems to do specifically in the schedule. But as the Blue Jays were chasing the Yankees, you had the Bisons with that very slim lead over Scranton Wilkes-Barre after their hot start to the year. It's been a great back and forth to watch from afar. What were some of the key moments in that series that really turned the tide and really kept the momentum in that Bison's dugout? Well, I think that the pitching staff overall just did a, a great job against Scranton Wilkes-Barre, not allowing them uh, to really get anything going. Uh, a pitching staff which has had some turnover, but for the most part, the, the, the pitchers and the starting rotation – that have carried the way uh, from June on. Guys like Zach Logue, who has come up from Double A, Bowden Francis, who was acquired, and you know we had Jeff Hem on earlier this year to talk about him. Um, they just went out and made solid starts. And I look at the final game of the series when the Bisons were losing to Scranton Wilkesbury, and you thought, okay, you take six out of seven, that'd be great. That it's a great series. And then Gregory Polanco, who was acquired just a couple of days ahead of time, uh, picked up on the free agent market. Uh, as a free agent uh, from the Pirates, comes in and hits a, a, a game-tying home run in the eighth inning. So to me, that was the big moment of the series was when Polanco hits the home run, Bisons are able to eventually win in extra innings. And you look back at the doubleheaders uh, where the Bisons were able to overcome um, a couple of scranton Wilkesbury. I wouldn't say miscues, but they took advantage of what scranton Wilkesbury gave them. And, and that was really, you know, you look at the doubleheader sweeps uh, those are key moments as well. Certainly marks of a great team. When you're given those extra chances, you can take advantage and cash in. Lots of cashing in for the Buffalo offense. We've talked about the pitching staff as well. I want to talk about some individual guys, two of whom we've spent a lot of time talking about. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about what Kevin Biggio's influence was like. He is back, had that big grand slam and that huge one-sided route against Rochester a couple of games ago. And then now, Kevin Smith coming back as a big leaguer. Now, obviously he's still the same Kevin Smith as talented as he ever was, but with that big league experience under his belt, had that incredible moment with his first hit, the first home run, did it all just about. 
have you noticed any changes around maybe Kevin Smith's aura? Not to ask you to put on your divination cap for a moment, but you know how it is in this game. It's not just stats on the field. It's energy. It's vibe. It's passion. And I certainly, Kevin, having that dream come true, he's got to come back perhaps radiating a different energy in a good way. Absolutely. And you're right. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a situation where you're from the big leagues and you come back down and maybe you're sulk a little bit or think that you've all of a sudden made it and you don't have anything left to prove here at this level. Uh, for a player like Kevin Smith, I think it's a situation where, you know, going into this year with a lot to prove, he was able to prove it and then go to the big leagues and now coming back, able to pick up right where he left off and had a hit in, in what was it, uh, three straight games since coming back down from the big leagues. Uh, so a player that has a lot of uh, influence on this team. I think when we look back on it, we're still uh, a couple of days away from knowing what the final postseason all-star ballots will look like, but I have to think Kevin Smith is going to get a lot of respect uh, in the infield and for the postseason balloting and probably in the league MVP voting. Um, we cannot vote for our own players, so uh, I, I can't vote for Kevin Smith, but I have to say seeing a lot of different players, sure, someone from Durham will probably be in the conversation with being the league champions, but I think with what Kevin Smith has done this year, continue to do it in the field at the plate since coming back from, from the big leagues, he'll definitely be in the conversation. And, and I would be a little bit surprised if Kevin Smith uh, doesn't walk home with some postseason hardware. A great re-addition to that Bison's roster, but also curious to know, thanks to our producer, Leo Mui, who in your view, Pat, and maybe we'll touch on this in more in depth when we do our season wrap up show a few weeks from now has been the best in season addition or acquisition. You talked about Gregory Polanco making that con contribution with the home run, but is there somebody who has made a longer term presence felt who didn't start the year either with the Bisons or even in the organization? I, I have to go back to the two starting pitchers I just mentioned a couple of moments ago in Bowden Francis and Zach Logue. I think for Logue to come in, you know, we're in Rochester right now, and he made his first AAA start, not his first AAA appearance, but because he pitched against Scranton in 2019 in a relief capacity. But his first AAA start goes out, throws shutout baseball, uh, pitcher of the week, and then has continued to be one of the top pitchers on the Bison's pitching staff all year long. If it, if it weren't for a guy like Brian Baker or, or some of the other relievers, Kirby Snead, uh, you'd be hearing a lot more about Zach Logue right now. Uh, because of what he's done every fifth day or every sixth day, depending on what the schedule is to look like. And then Bowden Francis coming over for, from the Nashville Sounds uh, as part of the trade with the Brewers. And he's gone out and pitched very well. He's throwing tonight as we record this uh, on Friday night in Rochester. He's going to pitch tonight uh, with a chance to go out and, and, and pitch another uh, strong performance. So, you know, as the Bisons have continued to play well and pitch well through August, you look back at those two guys and they have been, really some of the workhorses in the rotation this year that have allowed the relief core to not have to be overtaxed and allow someone like Brian Baker to pitch well and, and set him up for, for a big league promotion, Taylor Saucedo, uh, Kirby Snead, some of those other pitchers. So I think those are the two names. It's hard to choose one over the other because they have been kind of that, that steadying force uh, in the Bison rotation all year long turning into almost a roster that is complete with guys who have at least had a cup of coffee. So a highly caffeinated Buffalo Bisons roster. Now, Pat, let's finish with this, a two-parter. You are the only one of the members of the nest who are going to get a little bit of extra time behind the mic or in the dugout or at the ballpark with this final stretch coming up. So the two-parter is this, how is, does the team seem to be feeling about this last stretch? Certainly buoyed by becoming the champions and riding as high as they've been riding over the last six weeks. And secondly, how are you feeling about this extra time? Obviously, you got to the microphone a little bit later than myself and Tyler Murray and Bob Lippman and Nathan Strauss did. But for you, Pat, as well, how are you feeling about this final stretch? I'm looking forward to it because I think, you know, 10 more games. And, and uh, I think just the attitude of this team, uh, this is a team that you don't want to see the season end uh, because of how well they've played, how much we've seen them come together, whether it's the veterans like Christian Cologne and Tyler White leading by example, or some of the young players, like we have mentioned, uh, come in, whether from day one or midway through the season. And this is as complete of a team, pitching-wise, hitting, fielding, you name it. This is as complete of a team as I have seen, uh, especially in the Blue Jays affiliation. But I've been a part of Buffalo Bison baseball for basically 20 years, except for last season, uh, when there was no baseball. And 
I go back to the days when affiliated with Cleveland and every year the Bisons were in contention for a playoff spot. This is the same feeling I get from this team uh, right now is you look at the pitching staff, you look at the, the, the position players, you're going to see a lot of big leaguers come from this roster. So it, it, it's a shame the season comes to an end, but to have 10 extra games uh, in place of playoffs, it, you know, I think if you talk to the players, they would rather see uh, a traditional postseason, uh, the ability to compete for a league championship instead of Durham uh, being the league champion for, for having the best overall winning percentage. Uh, they're excited to keep playing, I think, to some extent. Uh, you know, this is the longest season they'll have played uh, as professionals if they haven't been to the big leagues or if they weren't on the 40 man roster before. Um, so I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag for them as they're excited to keep playing. They wish that was the wish there were playoffs uh, to play for. But, you know, with the st stats still being kept and reports still being written every day uh, about these players, um, they're trying to make the most of it as well. So, um, you know, definitely something that I think everybody's looking forward to. And so in some cases, um, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to be playing for a, a, a job next year or a spot of the organization next year. So trying to make some make the most of that as well. The future is about as bright as it has ever been at the top of the system and in the big leagues right now. Exciting times for the Jays, exciting times for the Bisons. And I know this, Pat, we will all be watching and tuning in over this final stretch. Looking forward to you sharing your passion and getting excited to be in behind the mic in that final stretch, watching a very special team, the 2021 Buffalo Bisons. Pat, as always, thanks very much for the time and your insights. We'll be tuning in and listening. And uh, in the meantime, get yourself a messy plate there in Rochester. Thanks, Tyler. It's been great to chat with you guys. Looking forward to uh, the next time we catch up. That's again, Pat Malacaro, voice of the Buffalo Bisons. Let's flap on down to double A, the lieutenant himself, Tyler Murray. Good day, my friend. The lineups have been delivered. The boys are back in town. We've got baseball at the tooth for the first time in what feels like ages. And uh, it has been a twisty, turvy, topsy, oddly interesting two weeks for the Fisher Cats. Yes, it sure has. Uh, nine games, unfortunately, canceled just for additional contact uh, tracing and uh, testing. Uh, six games on the road in Reading did not happen. The team just stayed here in town, but really fortunate to be back in business. Um, got some new players in town that we're excited to talk about. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, two seven inning games we tried for Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday was canceled because of rain. Um, but last night we got uh, we got seven innings in. That was a lot of fun. And then three games to wrap it up uh, tonight, tomorrow and Sunday. Last night, kind of a weird one. You certainly want to win any ball, ball game, and especially one in your home ballpark. But when you're the visitors at Delta Dental Stadium, weird to be on the other side of a walk-off? Yeah, it was a little strange. And the reasoning behind Harrisburg being the home team in New Hampshire, uh, the Blue Jays wanted to conserve as much pitch, pitching as possible after this delay. So a long layoff and not much time left, not many innings left in those arms. So uh, it was preparing for the potential of Harrisburg leading in the bottom of the seventh, the last inning last night, so they wouldn't have to pitch another uh, inning, the, the Fisher Cats, that is. And it turned out that uh, they wish they hadn't pitched that inning. It was uh, a few walks here, and then the big hit came with a walk-off double uh, for Harrisburg. So they scored three runs in the bottom of the last uh, to walk it off uh, in, uh, I don't want to say on the road, but in a different ballpark. So, yeah. Uh, best laid plans. And as we can see, that one went to waste, but we'll keep reading our English literature, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, LT, what are you looking forward to over these next couple of games here? Obviously, the season pretty much over, but some fresh blood joining the team from Vancouver and elsewhere and opportunities to continue to make some memories there in downtown Manchester, that's for sure. But what's the brief look ahead for New Hampshire these days? Yeah, we're really excited uh, for tomorrow, especially. Only 100 tickets are left. Um, so I think the fans in New Hampshire have finally convince themselves to come see a game even if you're not the MC Zick. so that's a big turning <laughs> point for our organization uh so that's been fun but yeah looking forward to a nice crowd tomorrow um there was a it was kind of a, a, the governor bought a bunch of tickets to reward people for working hard and uh, wearing masks uh, during the pandemic and getting the shot so we're appreciative of that but it's been fun to see kind of a, a clash of different guys from different affiliates um Obviously, we have some guys who are unable to play, but I mean, Spencer Horwitz is here and we, we love listening to all his uh, success on the Canadian entire Canadians baseball network throughout the season. And his first <laughs> swing, his first swing I'm, I'm nailing it. I got the sponsorship, right? His first swing, Zick, was almost a Manchester special. Ah. He hit it to the wall and right. And that big lefty power, assuming he's going to be back here next year, 
uh, we're looking at the home, home run king title potentially. So it, he's, he's been fun to watch as we see guys in a, a unique call up. Uh, you know, you, you don't usually get called up for four days, right? But that's what these guys have. They feel like they've got nothing to lose. And it's been fun to watch that. What has the vibe been like? I'm, I'm all on the vibes this episode, but really as we get to the end of the season, it, it is, you're, you're running on fumes and, and you're really just trying to finish through the tape. After the long layoff, I know you're not allowed in the clubhouse the same way, especially after the recent events, but have you been able to maybe take the temperature of the clubhouse? You've talked about this being a terrific clubhouse in AA New Hampshire this year, great energy, good group of guys, lots of excellent locker room guys, as a good friend of the podcast likes mm-hmm, to say. Mm-hmm. So what has been this return to action, albeit brief, been like for those guys down there in the clubhouse? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just tell you what I've seen. and it's, uh, it's been a lot of early swings, which has helped with the, uh, the pace of play, certainly. But it, this week has felt a little bit like that last day of the year when it's, okay, my batting average is this. What do I want to do? We got to line things up a little bit. But early swings has, has led to some quicker paced innings, at least. So that's been that's been fun to see how, how it affects things. But um, I would say just the energy guys, the Chavez Youngs and Kevin Vacunas of the world, they're still bringing it. They're still doing their handshakes and high fives and having a good time out there. Uh, and I think there was probably maybe a day or two where guys thought that the season's probably over just because of all the long layoffs. But um, great to see it back in action. And maybe after the first two days, they can settle back in. Okay, three-game weekend series. Let's finish on a high note. So that's Those are the current vibes I'm feeling. We love that. And LT, no, I know we don't have a lot of action to talk about, but, but I do have to say I now own a piece of New Hampshire Fisher Cats sports history. Wow. It, let's, let's see it. Come on. What <laughs> the jeez oh, the rowdy there rowdy is. sumo bobble belly that's right for the audio only listeners you get the bobble but you can't see the belly this <laughs> might be the finest minor league baseball promotion slash giveaway that i have seen and i'm severely biased but uh, i'm very grateful to you to Rowdy Red, a.k.a. Andrew Murray, and uh, the future Mrs. Rowdy Red for making this happen, getting this to me in Portland, Oregon. So uh, here it sits, and uh, cheers to you and the Fisher Cats, Tyler. I, uh, I didn't even get one myself, so enjoy that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of having fun at the stadium. It's, it's something that is easy to forget how much fun we get to have here at the ballpark and on the, around the nest. So I'm glad you got that. Uh, we miss you over here, Zick, but things are going well in Vancouver, it sounds like. I, I mean, I know it, at first it was... Uh, I, I, I had playoffs written down in the calendar for uh, I know. the high A West, but uh, it's just, it's tough to stay that consistently in, in, in a pretty loaded league. It seems like that with the, the short amount of teams, a lot of talent packed in, right? Yeah. And definitely some terrific moments of joy and things to be celebrated individual and on the team side. But when you have a team ERA of about five ten, and then a starter ERA of 5.70, you're not going to be able to win a lot of all games, even when as a team you're batting 270 with runners in scoring position. Guys are getting on base. Guys are driving them in. Number of guys among league leaders in hits, including Spencer Horwitz, who earned that much-deserved promotion and probably a little bit later than he would have been promoted had the Fisher Cats kept playing, and that allowed for him to set that hitting streak record. So I don't want to say thanks to the Fisher Cats because at the end of the day, we want health and wellness for everybody in the Blue Jays organization and beyond, but – Spencer Horwitz, 28 consecutive games with a hit. That's probably a record that will not be touched because if you get to that 20 game mark, maybe there'll be one or two guys along the way who could compete for it. But oftentimes someone's going to get promoted if they're hitting that well. So cheers to Spencer Horwitz. Certainly semi envious that you get to watch him for the end of the year. But not only do guys like Tanner Morris continue to, to produce as he's been the steadiest presence, I think, in the entire season for Vancouver. But then you're also getting guys like Phil Clark having an emergence. Back-to-back High A West Player of the Week. Only player in the league this year to go back-to-back with the distinction. So that was terrific. He did it with 13 hits, 23 total bases two weeks ago, or I guess three weeks ago now, uh, over five games played. And then last week got the award because he had an eight RBI game and finished with 12 RBI in six games played, as well as some home runs in the mix as well. So individual guys who are certainly still making it all worth coming to the ballpark for and the Canadians had a chance to play spoiler these last two weeks and they did, especially for the Aqua Sox who I've spent so much time on around the nest this year, lambasting, complaining, whining, worrying, being upset about the fact that the frogs essentially had a double a team in high a well, 
it came back around and it bit them because all those guys went up to double A Arkansas and the Aqua Sox are going to miss out on the playoffs as Spokane and Eugene have clinched here in the high A West for that best of five series starting next week. So no playoffs, no 500 season for the seas, even though that was in play till the very last week of the year, which is always a good sign, especially after that rough July. And just looking to finish on a good note here. And you know what? Of all the things that have happened this season, we might have our first rain out on Saturday. That's no. tomorrow. So uh, we shall see, though. I've been told Hillsborough had one rain out in 2013, the first year of the franchise, and then one earlier this year. And that's it. So uh, pray for me. There could be a doubleheader on the season's last day, but I hope that uh, cooler heads prevail. Wow. A rain out on the West Coast. I've never heard of such a thing. That's incredible. Yeah, uh, it does rain here. It's just not typically in the summer the same way. Gotcha. Well, look, um, glad to hear everything's wrapping up nicely in Vancouver. Uh, only other question I had for you, like on the seas was uh, guys we haven't had a chance to see yet. A lot of Vancouver players have come here to New Hampshire more than I think we expected with all the, the travel uh, length you have to make with this new call up. Um, who do you think is a, a current Canadian that could be an opening day starter here in New Hampshire that we should look forward to seeing? Tanner Morris, without a doubt, unequivocally so, and especially if he puts on 15 or 20 pounds in the offseason. I've been hearing that that's really the only thing that he needs to continue to do. And for guys like you and I, and AT, I know I've never met you in person, but just from your square, I can tell, I think all three of us, we're not going to grace the cover of muscle and fitness per se, but uh, you know what? We're going to put together a great pickup basketball team, long, lean, wiry, you know, we're going to get defense all up in your face, but Tanner Morris, for sure. He's going to be on your infield, double A 2022. That's going to be great to see. Will Robertson, I think, is going to get a double A chance as well. He's had a really hot stretch after returning from that wrist fracture that had him on the injury list for over two months this year in his first high A season and really just first full pro campaign. So I think Will Robertson will be a corner outfielder on opening day in New Hampshire. Guy who's got a great power bat and just is trying to get a little bit more consistent at the dish but plays a really great outfield, has a strong arm as well. And on the pitching side, is Adam Coffinstein going to get the opportunity to make it to the upper minors as a 21-year-old after a season in his first high A year that had some excellent starts? Don't get me wrong, especially of late, but there's still room for some improvement and really tightening it up once things start to go awry a little bit. I think as somebody who has obviously never thrown a single pitch anywhere near the professional ranks, all I can say is it does seem like when one thing goes wrong, that kind of might be the trickle effect that turns a leak into an onslaught or a flooding. So we'll see if he gets an opportunity after a great spring, we hope, because he's got the stuff. It's just going to be that consistency. So you never know. Kloffenstein could find his way to that Fisher Cats rotation. And then in the bullpen, Hagen Danner almost certainly is going to be in double A. But the way he's been throwing and the way the pitchers can progress – he might skip a level. He's got that up, up mid to upper 90s fastball that's been clocked in the high A West this year as high as 98. And then a 75 mile per hour curveball that is a hammer. Hagen's hammer, if you will. And it's going to be a really big weapon a la Kenley Jansen almost. It's a similar story. Catcher, great arm, not a great bat. And now can throw some upper 90s heat and has a great breaking ball as well. So Hagen Danner for me might be uh, the jewel of the bullpen next year for the Fisher Cats. I mean, if as if I wasn't looking forward to next year's opening day enough, this is big. We're very excited. Lining up the schedule came out a couple of weeks ago. Your schedule is coming out sooner or already did, Zick. You put it on the tee for me, Tyler, because if I had to shill one thing or try and promote one thing Canadians baseball outside of the lines, that is opening day at the Nat, April 19th, 2022. It's a Tuesday night. And after a two week road trip to start the year, the Seas will return home to Ontario Street for the first time since August 30th, 2019. That is a span of a lot of days. It's over 1,500 days without Seas baseball at the Nat. And uh, I can tell you this, sitting here on September 17th, that day is going to be a special day. Electric, it won't even come close to describing it. So exciting times ahead. The schedule's out now at CanadiansBaseball.com for anybody tuned in in BC or anywhere, really. We hope by the time we get to the season next year, travel restrictions will be lifted. People can come see Nat, or see rather Canadians baseball at the Nat in its natural habitat is what I meant to say because that's really the only place that Canadians baseball deserves to be. That is the type of special that the Nat is for anybody who has been there. So exciting times ahead. And uh, 
that quote that gets thrown around a lot, the cliche baseball quote about sitting by the window and looking out during winter and waiting for spring. I've never felt that more than I feel that now. So with uh, lots of excitement ahead, certainly uh, some excitement to enjoy a little bit of a more normal schedule and reflect on what has been an unreal 2021 for many respects, regardless of win-loss record. But the excitement builds for 2022 uh, in full force, Canadians baseball return. The countdown is on. Cannot wait, Zick. Keep up the good work out there, man. Thanks, LT. And gents, another edition of the Round the Nest has come to an end. And it's really hard to believe that we're wrapping up the 2021 season here as I get a little misty-eyed. But we'll do at least one more episode to wrap up our season, maybe a second one as well to maybe do some postseason awards. We will confer about that. Producer extraordinaire Leo Mui and I will get that dialed in and let you gentlemen know. But to everybody tuned in each and every week, thanks for putting up with us. We've got some great gold nuggets in there, and uh, especially here in high A, sometimes a little bit of fluff, but we're having fun with it along the way. Gents, Tyler, Andrew, Pat, Leo, thanks as always. Another edition of Around the Nest, out of the egg and into the world. Flap your wings and fly. We'll see you next week.